forget about it. You know, that's gonna be my rating for this movie. I'm Joey Tedesco, and thanks for watching the Cartoon Palooza. Even though the movie's been confirmed to be more of a Halloween movie than Christmas, it still shows up during the holiday season. And in fact, everywhere. The Nightmare Before Christmas is regarded by most as one of the greatest stop-motion animated movies of all time. Walk inside a Hot Topic, and you'll instantly find some form of merchandise surrounding it. People sing the songs, buy the products, and watch the movie dozens of times. And if you had to ask me, sure, I think it's a good movie. However, I'd be lying if I said I thought it was as good as everybody else says it is. <laughs> now I don't mind admitting when a film doesn't work for me on a personal opinionated level, but there are things that have made me question my enjoyment and if this movie really is a classic that people make it out to be. I also mentioned this before in another review for the stop motion film Corpse Bride. I've even gone as far as saying that I think that film is better than Nightmare. But even after revisiting Nightmare, I still feel the same way. If I had to narrow down my problems with the movie, as well as the general public opinion on it, I'd say I got about five. I think I could have had more, but that's crossing the line into nitpicking. You see, even I got limits. Here are the top five biggest Nightmare Before Christmas Santa flaws. You see what I did there? It's funny. It's because I'm funny. I'm funny. Get over it. This one's put pretty low on the list because it's not really a problem with the movie per se, but it still contributes to it, and a lot of people sympathize with it. But do you know a lot of fans don't even know who directed it? What I mean is that there have been plenty of people I've come across who've said that this is their favorite Tim Burton movie, downright assuming that he directed it. Guess what, the movie's over 20 years old now, and people can't seem to get it through their heads that Tim Burton didn't direct it. It was directed by Henry Selleck. Henry Selleck has made a great career at directing plenty of wonderful stop-motion movies. And Monkey Bone. Either way, it's like he doesn't get the credit he deserves for directing what some argue to be his masterpiece. Now, you can argue that this movie has a lot of the Tim Burton trademarks and aesthetics. This is because Burton is still responsible for producing the movie, as well as providing the story for it. But the thing is, Selleck was the guy on set given direction, looking over all aspects of this movie, all day, and for a few years because, let's face it, stop motion is not a speedy process. So at the end of the day, when people make it seem that this is a Tim Burton movie, it just doesn't seem fair. We all know that Dr. Seuss created the story of the Grinch stealing Christmas, but as far as the well-known short we watch, we give more credit to Chuck Jones and not Dr. Seuss. With that logic, then Dr. Seuss should be getting as much credit for the Ron Howard movie, which yeah, I don't even think he was alive for. So why is it such a problem for people to give more credit to Burton than Selleck? Now I know what you're thinking, that this is not a problem with the movie itself, but I still feel like it contributes to the movie general perception. Even though the title is Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas, it don't mean that it's completely his movie. Honestly, I think it's about time we give credit where credit is due. So let's talk about Sally and her character, shall we? In this movie, we have a Victor Frankenstein archetype create the character Sally. As far as this character goes, she's got a great design. I love how she looks, as well as the detail of having it stuffed with autumn leaves. It's a little touch that makes the character feel like Halloween. Now, you can argue that Disney would not want to have an actual corpse put together, but like I said, when I think of Halloween, one of the things I think about are the autumn leaves falling. As far as everything else goes, I don't think I completely understand why she's here except for the obvious, we need to have a companion for the hero. Now it's obvious that Halloween Town is pretty much every horror movie cliche and character from wolfmen, vampires, homicidal clowns, 
Maurice Sendak's leftover characters from where the wild things are. Anyways, having the Frankenstein monster doesn't seem odd. I think I'm more confused with the creator's motivation. He always complains that she leaves his sight. But what do you expect? Just rebuild her or take her apart and start from scratch. Now, you can say that's what he eventually does, but he still keeps her around after he created a new one. Why? After plenty of times where she roofies you, do you want to take the hint and get rid of her? It isn't like that one scene where she puts him out to sleep. It's implied that she does it all the time. So what reason would a creepy old guy want to have a hot female assistant for? Yeah, um, besides odd sexual fantasies played out, I don't see why having her around really matters other than plot progression. No, wait, even that isn't a big deal. You could say she tries to warn Jack against stealing Christmas, but it ends up happening anyways. You can say she tries to save Santa Claus, but she ends up getting captured. So really, what is the point of this character? Now you can go for the really obvious answer of her working with Jack, but I'm gonna save that for a later point. Either way... Um, she's got a good song? What's Jack trying to accomplish again? The basic premise to this movie is great. It's what would happen if Christmas turned into Halloween. With this premise, we have the Pumpkin King, Jack Skellington. He's the ruler of the Halloween realm and finds out that he's having a midlife crisis. So he finds out about Christmas and suddenly feels the urge to understand what it's all about. Now the climax is where Jack convinces the town to help him create their own Christmas by spreading their own twisted tricks and treats. However, he ends up doing more harm to Christmas than saving it, like a twisted Kirk Cameron. Or just plain Kirk Cameron. But still, I don't understand why he had to take over Christmas if this all could have been resolved through one simple way. Put up a wreath and celebrate the holiday with your friends. What's the jump between kidnapping Santa Claus and taking over the holiday to simply celebrating the holiday? Now, you can argue that this is because he's a representation of a holiday that, by learning about another, would make him change his own identity. However, he's still under the impression of scaring people like it's Halloween Part 2. I used to think that this was all the town's fault for missing the point, but in all fairness, they shouldn't get the point to begin with. It's not their fault for putting scary images in children's heads since that's what they're supposed to do. It's kind of like if Easter took over Christmas, the Easter Bunny would give out candy as opposed to presents. Or if leprechauns took over it like St. Patrick's Day, they'd give out whiskey. It really comes down to why Jack doesn't make the connection. You can say that without him wanting to steal Christmas, that there wouldn't be a movie to begin with. But I think there were other ways you could have had this happen differently. With what we have here... Darn, it's still confusing. Lock, Stock, and Barrel. Of all the characters in this movie, there aren't any I outright hate. Except these three. According to the movie, these are the three trick-or-treaters who work for the movie's villain. Like an idiot, Jack asks them to capture Santa Claus to let him know that he's taken over the holiday. I hate their voices, I hate the way they look, I hate the fact that they're given a song, I hate how they end up disappearing in the final act of the film for a few scenes, I just... Ugh. Anyways. So I still don't understand how they can actually be trick-or-treaters. Are they supposed to be the dead souls of trick-or-treaters? That would make more sense, but like a lot of things in this movie, it's never explained. They were shortly established to be working for the movie's bad guy. If Jack is aware of this, then how come he trusts them to have them capture Santa Claus? Because as soon as they make the deal with Jack, they go off singing a song about all the different ways they will dismember, maim, and kill Santa Claus and then send them off to the movie's bad guy, the Boogeyman. Great foresight for a guy who doesn't have eyes. Either way, say I were fine with this. Say I wanted to see Jack kidnap Santa Claus. Why not have the mayor do it? He seems like the most trustworthy of all the characters there. In fact, every other character seems to be more trustworthy than these three farts. So even after they sing this song, which of all the tracks in this movie is by far my least favorite, Korn couldn't even make this work in a cover, but that's probably a discussion for another day. But by far, what sucks about this is how they throw Santa at the villain and eventually come back at the end as if they forgot what happened. So what? Do you realize your leader was dropped in a vat of acid? Nothing phases you about this? 
Now, I think these characters could have been given more background and even screen time to make them more tolerable, but as it is, they didn't do a lot for me. And the things they did do for me, I just hated. Now, before I go to the biggest problem I have with The Nightmare Before Christmas, let's talk about the few nitpicks that I had with the movie that I think I could have passed off and really didn't include on this list, but may as well just talk about them anyways. Terrible news, folks. The worst tragedy of our time. Jack has been blown to smithereens. Really? Because we've seen him take his own head off. How do you think bullets would make any difference between killing him? Oh, and I don't understand the line between the folk of Halloween Town wanting to scare children to possibly killing them. Yeah, man-eating snakes, man-eating wreaths, that don't seem like a good idea. So here it is, folks, the biggest problem I have with The Nightmare Before Christmas. And believe it or not, a lot of people seem to pass it off. But for me, it always comes down to this. Here it is. For it is plain, as anyone can see, we're simply meant to be. How? What makes you two want to fall in love with each other other than looking similar? Believe it or not, the biggest problem I have with this movie is making Jack and Sally forced love interests. Throughout the movie, it's only been indicated that they're, at most, friends. They shared just as much romance as Jack and the Mayor. In fact, I would like to think in another draft and time period, Jack and the Mayor fell in love with each other. Now you can argue that Sally spends most of the film falling for Jack through simple glances with a large doe eyes, but it don't change the fact that Jack doesn't seem to care a lot about her. But in all fairness, Jack don't have any lips, so how can he get a good kiss is beyond me. But what I don't understand is, this is a problem I have, and yet a lot of people I talk to it about it, they seem to think that this is one of the best things about the movie. You get the matching Halloween costumes for the husband and wives, and even the DVD cover has both Sally and Jack hugging each other. Point being, if people like to complain about how Disney movies have characters fall in love at first sight, then why does this get a pass? I really would have preferred if they kept the relationship mutual in this film, but it made it seem like they're lovers, and it just doesn't work. In fact, you want to see another loving relationship developed and each person invested in one another? Watch Corpse Bride. This is where I feel that movie improves on what this movie fails at. Because Nightmare's main focus was on the merging of Halloween with Christmas, it makes the love story aspect fall a little flat since there really isn't that much time that could have been devoted to it. Or if it were, it would have been expanded on. But given that this movie is animated through a painstakingly long process, expanding it would have been more challenging. Either way, if you feel Jack and Sally represent what true love is, I'm sorry, but you need to rethink of what your idea of love is. So, if you come across this video, and at this point you're just like, this hipster schmuck is just bashing on something that's popular. At the end, do I really think that this is a bad movie? Not really, I guess. With all my bemoaning, whining, and dissecting, this is a very well-made movie on a technical aspect. The worlds they created and the way they were animated are fantastic. Even today, it holds up and the expressions they were able to have on these characters are superb. The Oogie Boogie sequence is a great throwback to the Fleischer shorts with Cab Calloway along with great lighting and set design. The songs are fantastic to listen to, with the exception of that one. So I don't fault people for liking to watch this movie either on Halloween or Christmas. I just think that if something is made to seem incredibly popular, that you're bound to have people question its popularity. It's kind of like Avatar when it first came out, when it was promoted to be this big technical achievement, and it still kind of is, but the story was a little flat. Now as far as this movie goes, it's not bad. I just think more time was spent on making it look good more than fine-tuning its story for a feature length which has a great premise, mind you, but kind of feels less satisfying in the story department. I think if you like watching this movie, or are interested in checking it out for the first time, there really is no harm there. I just feel with the better stop motion movies we have been getting lately, and seem to continue to get, Nightmare was the predecessor that we can thank for bringing better movies. So my question for the day doesn't really have to do with the movie per se, but kind of a reflection of where I've been. You see, this is the fifth year anniversary of my first Cartoon Palooza review. 
So, it really had me wondering, where do I go from here? What would you like to see change on this show? Something that I can keep an open mind with. Let me know. I'm Joey Tedesco. Thanks for watching this review. And have a safe holiday. Take care, everybody.